concerning China and China's various ambitions for the world. And we very much look forward to his keynote. And so I'm going to hand over to Professor Chris Bellamy, our first keynote speaker of this conference. A very warm welcome. Wonderful to have your expertise today and your presence with us. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Good, good. Okay, I'm going to share my screen now. Okay, here we go. Technology is great when it works, isn't it? Um, well, good morning, um, oh, ladies and gentlemen in Europe. Uh, good afternoon in South Asia. And um, good, good evening in Australia. Um, so I'm going to talk today about Silk Roads and the Gra Dragon's Belt, China and the quest for maritime dominion in the Indo-Pacific and beyond. I'm going to focus on the Indo-Pacific because I've only got 25 minutes. Uh, at the end of the time, um, there will may be a few minutes for questions. Uh, the Silk Road refers to the ancient route which took silk, the most valuable commodity that was manufactured, in, could be manufactured in China, although it carried other goods as well, to the Roman Empire. It was at its height, I suppose, 600 BC or before the Christian era to 600 AD Christian era. Um, hello, sorry. Um, yes, it um, um, ran into trouble, uh, first of all, with the um, um, conflict between Christianity and Islam from the 17th, 17th century. Uh, and um, then with the expansion of the uh, Ottoman Empire, uh, which led, which cut Europe off from uh, trade with the East, and led across the sea, of course. Um, first of all, Portuguese, Vasco da Gama, going into around the Cape of Good Hope and into the Indian Ocean, uh, uh, and then an Italian funded by the Spaniards, who went the other way and bumped into America, uh, which, which he probably didn't know was there. So the ancient Silk Road rep replicate uh, uh, very much the modern Chinese Belt and Road initiative. Uh, the only difference really is that they didn't have the Suez Canal. Um, in 2013, the Chinese President Xi Jinping launched uh, what was initially called the One Belt, One Road initiative. Partly, I think, it was then renamed in 2016 uh, the Belt and Road initiative. Uh, partly, I think, because there are actually two roads, and the other one being the Northeast Passage, uh, it, which incorporates the Russian Northern Sea route. So, a little more, certainly Moscow, of course, as um, Palto will know. Um, but that's not the whole of it. That's just the Russian bit of it. And that's the official Russian name. Uh, uh, the whole uh, route, including the Barents Sea, we can perhaps refer to as the Northeast Passage, but many people use the term Northern Sea Route uh, for the whole uh, route. Because, uh, as we all know, the Arctic ice is melting and you can, and you can get um, incre it's increasingly possible to navigate through there. Um, now the official Chinese name was, and remain, it remains the official name, the Silk Road Economic um, 21st Century Maritime Silk Road Development Strategy. Um, although Belt and Road Initiative is now the official uh, Chinese uh, for translations into English, um, Chinese media often still use the original one belt, one road uh, in Chinese, Yidai Yihu Chang Yi, if I've got that right. Um, 
and that's the source uh, one for this, which is a very good paper and a recent one. Um, so, ironically, perhaps the post 2013 belt is the old land silk road, and the roads now two of them are maritime. Since the launch of the Belt and Road Initiative in 2013, 136 countries and 30 international organisations have um, signed BRI cooperation documents um, and um, exchanged $6 trillion worth of trade with China. Um, the Chinese government has put forward uh, a narrative for the initiative, uh, but inevitably a project of this enormous size and ambition um, has um, created some suspicion and opposition. Uh, I shall start then with the uh, original maritime Silk Road, which closely replicates the maritime trade routes. Uh, China has invested uh, more than, in more than 60 countries and the investment is estimated at about or in excess of one trillion, one thousand billion dollars. The Maritime Silk Road begins at Kwangju in uh, China via Haiku and then down to Singapore. Um, key thing is that it passed, passes through the um, South China Sea, and I shall return to that later. It then heads up to Calcutta, down to Colombo, up to Gwadar in Pakistan, uh, down to Mombasa in Kenya, uh, round to Djibouti, up the Red Sea and through the Suez Canal, uh, as far as Piraeus, uh, the port for Athens, and in 2016, the um, Chinese acquired a 51% share in the port of Piraeus. So it's their um, entry into Europe. The, the Silk Road does, or the Maritime Silk Road does extend as far up as, as Venice. Um, where well, there's also been Chinese investment. And all the, the places marked on this map uh, have, been the, um, have, have been the target of Chinese investment. Um, Chinese companies have in fact poured nearly $11 billion into overseas ports in the last decade, uh, gaining access to strategic maritime hubs uh, and that as I've said does raise some concerns about uh, Beijing's growing uh, clout influence across the world. Um, Chinese enterprises have invested in 25 port projects in 18 countries through to December 2020 uh, according uh, to public documents reviewed by uh, Nikkei. Um, uh, most of these Chinese investments have fared well um, and the numbers indicate that China is making vast strides on, on, on its infrastructure project. Um, the majority of the port projects are linked to just two operators, China Merchants Group and the Costco Group, um, uh, the China um, Corporation. The latter had scored a coup in 2016, as I've said, by acquiring that 51% stake in Piraeus. Um, and in, just in November 2019, Costco uh, signed a, an agreement, a further agreement for uh, 600 million euros uh, in further investment. So an enormous investment in, in ports and, and the, the pinnacle of it, I suppose, is Piraeus, which is now uh, a Chinese controlled port. Um, compared 
2013, 2019, there had been a, a 75% increase in freight handle. Uh, and um, the key to this, of course, is it's China's gateway directly into the European Union. Uh, previously, uh, to, to get into to Western Europe, they would have had to carry um, cargo in ships around to places like Rotterdam and Hamburg. Now they can um, deliver them to Piraeus, and you can see what a vast uh, port it now is. as a Costco ship there with um, quite a few containers on it. Um, and then it can be taken to European clients in far shorter spans of time. Um, here is a, a, a graphic summarizing China's global investment in ports and wharf, wharves, wharfs or wharves. Um, and, and you can see it's not just uh, Greece, it goes as far as uh, uh, far Spain and Belgium. And uh, there's also actually been a huge Chinese input to the um, London Gateway port uh, on the Thames, the, the enormous cranes there came from China as well. Now I said that, um, sorry, if we now turn to the belt, the belt, uh, which is the, goes over land, uh, there are three uh, initial uh, corridors. The first from Beijing, pretty much straight through Ulaanbaatar in Mongolia to Irkutsk in Russia. From Shan in the middle of China to Urumqi, Urumqi. Um, still in China, and from Kunming, there's also a link between Dalian, which is an important port for Peking, or Be Beijing, to Kanzhou, that's a, a rail link. And from Kunming uh, through to Dhaka in Bangladesh, with a branch to Kwak Fu on the, the uh, Bay of Bengal, uh, and more of that later, and a route down to uh, the um, uh, in Indochina Peninsula as far as Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia where it links up with the Maritime Silk Road uh, at Singapore. Uh, this corridor is known as the Bang Bangladesh China India Myanmar Economic Corridor and this one is the China uh, Indonesian Peninsula Economic Corridor. From Urumqi, the um, belt extends as far as Horgas, which is a, a city which straddles, straddles the border between China and Kazakhstan. Um, and the whole area there is, is a free trade area. So it's, it's really a, a big jumping off point for China exchanging goods. Uh, with the world further west. Um, from Khorgas, sorry, from Urumqi, we go down to Gwadar in Pakistan. From, and that's known as the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. From Khorgas, we, we go to Tashkent uh, in Uzbekistan, to Tehran in Iran, up to Ankara, the capital of Turkey, to Istanbul, and thence into Western Europe. Uh, terminating with investment in Duisburg, which um, is the largest steel producer in Germany, uh, and you can probably imagine is in the, the Ruhr. There's also a, a side road up, up to Anaklia in Georgia on the Black Sea. Uh, and then from Horgas again, that crucial, uh, crucial point, goes up to Astana in northern Kazakhstan, then to Kazan in Russia, and then of course to Moscow. This uh, somewhat simpler graphic I, I think summarizes it quite well with some of the key, um, the key points. Uh, and it also shows the other um, maritime Silk Road the Northeast Passage, which includes uh, the Russian Northern Sea Route. Uh, and 
here is a, a, a map again summarizing the, the Maritime Silk Road and the, the belt across Eurasia. Um, it's the whole initiative is obviously broken up into uh, parts, the various economic corridors. I've mentioned the Ch China, Indochina corridor and the Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar corridor um, and the China, China, Pakistan economic corridor. There's also the China, Central Asia, West Asia corridor. Uh, and the uh, new Eurasia land bridge economic corridor. Um, uh, a, a Chinese train recently uh, went through the Bosphorus Tunnel, um, having originated in China, but having been able to circumvent Russia. Back to that uh, southern maritime. Silk Road, and I mentioned the South China Sea. Because access to and egress from China has to pass through that sea, uh, you can imagine that it's going to be a considerable concern to China. And, uh, <laughs> I don't know where it came from. Um, and it's therefore not surprising that China has gone to considerable lengths to um, secure, to try to secure access and egress through the strategically important South China Sea. Um, before 1949, before the, um, the communist victory in the Chinese Civil War, the Republic of China had uh, um, put forward a claim to the so-called nine dash line. It, it has sometimes been 10, sometimes 11, but it's now back to nine, uh, uh, which is shown on this map here. And you can see, <coughs> excuse me, that this um, um, extends Chinese claims well beyond uh, China itself. Um, the two um, areas that are particularly nine the nine dashes are there in green the um there are two areas which are particularly contested uh, the first is the spratly islands where there is a a uh, potential dispute or a dispute with um uh, the philippines and the paracel islands where there is a dispute with vietnam and both the um uh, the Chinese uh, and, and the, the Philippines claim the Spratlys, and the Vietnamese and Chinese both claim the Parcells. Well, in order to reinforce their claim to the Spratlys, the um, Chinese hit on an absolutely brilliant idea. And this was um, to build artificial or turn the reefs mostly uninhabited reefs uh, in the Spratly Islands, into, there are three of the nine dashes, into artificial islands. If we take just three examples, uh, Quasiton Reef, for example, it's in the western Spratly Islands. That's what it looked like in the summer of 2014. If you um, got stranded in your boat, you might uh, be able to m make uh, SOS in big letters on the beach. Uh, somebody did in a similar situation recently and get rescued. If you landed there in 2016, uh, you might find yourself up against a large Chinese military base. So that's 2013, that's 2016. Um, that's later in 2016. If um, the next one is Fiery Cross Reef, uh, again, that's it in 2006, uh, innocuous um, reef. Uh, that's it in 2015 uh, with concrete and 
various uh, military and industrial installations. Um, the thing about this is, of course, that under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, you're entitled to t t uh, 12 miles, 12 nautical miles of territorial sea out from uh, the baseline of your territory. And therefore, this en enables the, the Chinese to claim, although uh, many people uh, don't buy it, uh, more of the South China Sea as their own territorial sea. The final one is Mischief Reef, and it's the most mischievous uh, because it's well within Philippine, the Philippine exclusive economic, uh, exclusive economic zone. It's just 129 nautical miles from the nearest Philippine city, and as you can see, that's well within the 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone, which states are allowed under the... Um, UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Um, that's what uh, Mischief Reef looked like in 2012. That's yeah. Mischief Reef now. You can see that they've widened the, the, an inlet uh, to, to the bottom left, and that's led to speculation that they intend to create uh, a naval base on it. And you can see round the top of the reef uh, what was uh, just a reef has now been covered in concrete and buildings. So China is going to very extensive lengths to secure its critical uh, passage through the South China Sea. Then uh, we next move to the Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar uh, economic corridor. Um, there is a strategic implication here too. Uh, th this shows the um, coastal state, Rakhine state of Myanmar, uh, where the terminus of the uh, of a Chinese oil and gas pipeline uh, is based, and where they are probably going to build a deep water port. Now that has a strategic implication as well, because Rakhine state is the home of the Rohingya people who have been flowing out of, of um, Myanmar into Bangladesh in vast numbers. This is a refugee camp in Bangladesh. These are Myanmar refugees, so they're moving from Myanmar into Bangladesh, so they are refugees and not internally displaced persons um, cross, crossing from Myanmar into Bangladesh. Uh, there are refugee or internally displaced person camps in Myanmar and about um, 600,000 uh, had, uh, by 2017, 600,000 Muslim Rohingyas had fled the uh, Buddhist uh, majority state of Myanmar, um, which is also Myanmar's poorest, and it may well now be up to a million. Uh, the um, Chinese have been funding, therefore, a, uh, an oil and gas pipeline, which you see here, from Kiao Fu on, on the Bay of Bengal uh, to take um, oil and gas into China. Um, they we're also going to build a railway. That was cancelled in 2014 because of um, people were not happy, uh, but it could be resurrected. Um, and um, there are insurgent groups in northern uh, Myanmar, and this is a map uh, where you can see the areas where there have been um, armed battles, which have been going on since 2011, uh, and um, you can see that they're right astride this crucial oil and gas pipeline bringing, to bring oil and gas from the Bay of Bengal to the uh, Chinese city at Kunming. Kunming. Therefore, the Myanmar army has uh, stationed troops along the, the pipeline. This is a map of the, of the oil and gas pipeline showing the, 
the various um, servicing points along it. And this is a map showing battalions of the Myanmar army currently positioned. This is 20, 2019, this map, uh, currently positioned along the cor corridor. I quote, I counted 40 battalions. The British army has 49, but ours are bigger. Um, so back now to the um, overall uh, route. The, the, other, the other strategic issue, which is it may be nothing, nothing to do with it, it may be nothing to do with it, but the Rohingya people who are Muslims uh, in, uh, in, in Myan Myanmar, um, there, there is also some persecution going on of mu the mu Muslim Ouijas in the other area where the belt goes through um, in Xinjiang province. So China's Belt and Road, the road is not completely smooth uh, out westward. Um, the, the third point I want to focus on is um, Djibouti. Traditionally, China has not established overseas military bases. Um, that changed um, in 2015. Uh, negotiations for China to construct a strategic base in Djibouti began with uh, negotiations with the president uh, Gele in about 2015. Mm -hmm. They were concluded in 2016, uh, and the Chinese began to build a naval base. The Chinese Navy is is known somewhat confusingly as the People's Liberation Army Navy uh, because it, it was for decades a very um, land dominated uh, strategic uh, picture. Uh, so it's known as PLAN, but it, it's, an, it's a Chinese naval base, which was formally opened on 1st of August 2017. Um, and China has said that it's primarily to support military logistics for Chinese forces in the Gulf of Aden, where they're fighting piracy, and peacekeeping and humanitarian operations in Africa. Uh, it also and it's uh, staffed by approximately 400 personnel. Um, that's the Chinese statement on what it's for, but it does, of course, control uh, the entrance to to the um, to the Red Sea. Uh, uh, there are other military bases in. Djibouti, of course, there's a French base, uh, there's an American base, there's a Japanese base, and there's an Indian base. And um, the, uh, the various contingents there, um, there is the potential for uh, a bit of uh, friction. Uh, this is the um, uh, Chinese base taken from above. Uh, taken from above. Um, the it, it is very heavily fortified. Um, and it's not just uh, the uh, Djibouti naval base to support the Chinese ships in the Indian Ocean and to potentially uh, control that crucial uh, strait, uh, the Bab el Mandeb. Um, the Chinese are also building, and have nearly finished, a railway from Djibouti down to um, Addis Ababa. Four billion pound railway to connect Ethiopia's capital to, to the new Chinese invested port. So the, um, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is also extending deep into Africa.
I just so those are the three uh, key points I wanted to focus on uh, on the Southern Maritimes upgrade. Uh, uh, that the next one to be developed is uh, the faci facility at Gwadar in Pakistan, and I understand that like Djibouti, it's very heavily fortified. The other route, which I don't have time to mention um, very much, is of course the Northern Sea Route, uh, and that is offers a second sea route. Um, the that's the Northern Sea Route is the official Russian name, and it's that bit. But the um, the Northeast Passage, as we might call it, extends through the Barents Sea as far as Rotterdam. Uh, and if you look at the comparison, you can see that the Northern Sea Route will knock up to uh, up to a fortnight off the time it would take to go via the Suez Canal route. The only problem at the moment is that the um, Northern Sea Route is only navigable uh, from July to November, uh, and the um, whereas the Suez Canal route is obviously navigable all year round but as the arctic ice melts uh, the northern sea route will be able to carry more ships um, the uh, at the moment they they still need to be uh, escorted by icebreakers and as you can imagine the russians are charged for this service um, so it, it potentially shortens the journey from asia to europe by about 40 percent compared with the Suez Canal route. Well, that uh, concludes my uh, uh, presentation. Um, I, I would just say that I do not think that uh, China's intentions are malevolent. Uh, it would not be the first time that a great industrial power had developed a global trading network, pivoting on maritime, maritime trade as well as land trade. And that, that required, of course, a massive merchant fleet with a strong navy and supporting naval bases uh, to protect it. I wonder where the Chinese got that idea from. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Professor Bellamy, for that fascinating uh, keynote. and. Uh, it's extraordinary, some of those slides, how up to date things are and no doubt still moving at a pace, even in these challenging times. Um, I believe that we've possibly got some time for a few questions if you're happy to take them. I've got a question of my own in a moment, but we'll see if there are any questions from any of the conference participants. Does anyone have any questions for Professor Bellamy? Oh. Well, in which case, could I set the ball rolling? Um, yeah, I'm, yes, I'm very interested to see the way that obviously China has forged purposeful relationships um, along this route. Um, I'd be interested to know your opinion um, about the fact that very recently uh, Somaliland signed um, an agreement with Taiwan uh, one where they were basically, obviously Somaliland is not recognized by the United Nations, although it is a functioning state. Um, it has obviously seen a certain sort of synergy with Taiwan's international status. And these two um, elements have come together and have signed um, a sort of agreement, a friendship something that I imagine would not go down particularly well in Beijing. I'd be interested to know what your thoughts would be in that regard, especially as um, Somaliland is having the port of Berbera uh, developed by Dubai, Dubai Port World. Well, I think that you have two, um, if you like, competing uh, major wealthy um, elements, um, uh, the uh, you, uh, Dubai, Dubai is part of the uh, Arab world and uh, China um, 
competing, if you like, by uh, investing in different bits of the Horn of Africa. Um, I, I, I think, I mean, there is concern that the Chinese are buying up large amounts of um, real estate, if you like, in, uh, in the developing world, and that there is a, a risk of a, um, a risk of, of, a, of, a de of a debt trap. And that's one of the reasons which has actually stopped Myanmar taking more uh, investment from China, because they're worried that they will end up in terrible debt that they can never replay. Repay. Yes. So, uh, yeah, it's, um, I mean, in Djibouti, you have the French, the Americans, the Japanese, the Indians, and the Chinese, uh, and they are all competing with each other, and they've brought up different bits of uh, this small, uh, small state. Yes. Um, and I, I think it's only, it's not unreal. It's not surprising that uh, Taiwan would similarly uh, want to invest in Somaliland. Um, uh, China, of course, uh, regards, does not recognize Taiwan as a separate country. Yes. Uh, and they, they, um, they, they want to have it themselves. So um, it's, it's another one of these areas where a, a big power, big power rivalry spills over into uh, a competing presence in, in, other, in another country or other countries. Thank you for that.